break this psalm down because it is referred to as a classic psalm. There are so many, uh, if not most of the psalms, that sort of fall into this structure and flow that our psalmist puts before us. This is a perfect example of why we are drawn to the psalms. We go to the psalms for many reasons. We, we open our Bibles sometimes when we're looking for need. We're not exactly sure what those words are, but we want to be reminded that God is present with us in a moment, in our time, whether it's a time of mourning or a time of dancing. We turn to our God, so we often hold our Bibles and we flip it open to the middle because we know that's where we find the Psalms. We long for words that remind us of who God is and that God claims us still, even with all of our faults and all of our foibles. So this basic structure that goes into a classic psalm like this one, we can break down, I think, into five key things that our psalmist knows. And ultimately, these are five things that we can claim, that we can identify with, and that we ourselves, when we talk to God, become good conversation starters. So those five things that our psalmist knows, those five things that we know, starts with, I know God who God is. The second is, I know who I am. I know who God is. I know who I am. There's a good chance now that I trust to know that I belong to God. I know God. I know me. I know whose I am. And when I have those three things down, it's pretty safe to know that it is time for me to pray. I know to pray. I know God. I know me, I know my dependence upon God. I know I need to sit in communication with my God. And finally, I know how to live as God's beloved. I know God, I know me. I know I belong to God. I know to pray, to listen, to be with my God. And when I have done those things and I've made that revelation, I know that there is a way for me to live as God's beloved. These elements are in most psalms, and often in this order, but not always. So let's apply this basic stru structure to Psalm 30 this morning. So we will sort of draw out this psalm throughout our time together, Beth, so just be prepared. All right. I know who God is, and we pick this up from the very start. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and you did not let my foes rejoice over me. O oh Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh, you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is for but a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Do you hear it? Who God is or what God has done? For what does the psalmist say God did? It's all listed in these verbs here in our text. God drew me up, healed me, brought up my soul from Sheol, Meaning, our psalmist here was in a near-death moment. Surely, life was at the end. But here they are to continue to sing God's praise, for God restored me to life. There is hope in God's presence. I know who God is. I don't know about you, but verse 5 from this psalm is one of my favorite lines defining God and, defend, and defining our dependence upon our God. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. We can hear that and picture our children dancing up front and for, in front of us this morning. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. There may be many sleepless nights, but we trust and we hold on and we cling to our God. This hope in our God is something we need desperately. So I read this verse all week, this, this scripture, and I kept being drawn to, to verse 5. 
Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. And then as I read it again yesterday, by the time Saturday afternoon rolled around, I had new images in my mind to go with these words. We're in a country in the midst of weeping, and it is a long, long and dark night. It is as though we've forgotten what day it is, or even what year it is. The ugly reality we have seen in humanity this week with white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia, is gut-wrenching. Today's KKK feel no shame. Unmasked, they marched in protest, carrying torches and spouting neo-Nazi rhetoric. This is not okay. This is not who America is. Beth, do we have that image? Especially for us, Christian Americans, we must be asking, what have we done with you, our God? Hatred, racism, violence, and loathing for another human being on the basis of their humanity is not who we are. It is not the way of love that we claim. These faces, these chilling faces that were with me as I tried to sleep, have become the poster children for white oppression. They look like someone we know. They are our cousin and our uncle. They are our neighbor, our coworker, our husband, our wife. They are our son. They are our daughter. They are our little league coach. They are faces that we would invite freely to the Lord's table. And they are faces that could easily be ours. But they're not. We would not march down 58 Highway with Confederate flags and tiki torches. But these young men and women learned somewhere that their hatred was justified. That it is warranted. And maybe we taught them, not explicitly, but the mainline white church in our complacency left room for this hatred when we let a slur hit our ears without a rebuke, or in our discomfort even, we sniggered at a racist joke instead of saying that it was inappropriate. Our complacency left room when we used words like those people as though we are set apart from or above or not connected to or in relationship with a, a person or group that doesn't look or act like us. But can we see it now? These faces of evil look like us. And until we stand up and say something, or do something, or truly live the gospel justice and unity that Jesus stood for, they might as well be us. Our complacency has allowed God's beloved people of color to weep for generations, and our silence, church, has been a sin. This is not what love looks like. This is not the God we know. This is not a way that God claims either. I know God. You know God. This is not what God looks like. If we are to ever see the joy in the morning at the end of this dark night of racism, we will need to be the ones bearing that love. We who call ourselves Followers of Jesus must become that prophetic voice of hope and unity in our nation. There is good news. There is strength and promise as the church has been present on the ground in Charlottesville. We take pride in the ecumenical gathering. You may go to the next picture, please, Beth. We take pride in an ecumenical gathering of clergy and faithful laity of worshiping, praying, and standing up in silent protest against this face of evil. We are a nation that is weeping, and God cries too. 
And it is time for us to allow our tears to become healing waters that unite and welcome and flow with intentionality and healing and radical hospitality, tears that we can offer that bring a change that is truly needed. We know who God is. Our psalmist is also very self-aware. I know me. I know where I am strong, and I certainly know where I am weak, our psalmist says. He also knows where he comes from, his connection with God. I know I am God's. And so our psalmist can continue on with these words. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. Did you hear that? But by God's favor, God established me as a strong mountain. I am solid and sure I will not be moved because I have not achieved being me on my own. I have done it with my God. I could not get here all by myself. I know who God is and I know who I am. And because I know those two things, I know that I am dependent upon God. I would not be me without God being God. How necessary it is to be open and to communicate with God. And so our psalmist says, I know, I'm God, I know God's God and I'm me and I need God, so I'm going to be open to talking to God. Read what we have next here at 8. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. Did you hear that? Help me, O God, I pray. The psalmist is saying, we need each other, God, you and me. You and I are stronger together than we are apart. And as a result, I know how to live as God's beloved it's really kind of neat in that, that, that definition there. Did you hear it? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? God, if I'm dead, if I'm not here, who will be there to praise your name? You need me just as much as I need you. So as we're in this together, let's all find a way to share this joy, to share this love. We know this. Because the return to praise that are on the lips of our psalmist. And the absolute truth of joy is that he can't keep it to himself and he wishes to share it. I know God. I know who I am. I know I'm dependent on God and I've listened to God and it's time for me to live my life accordingly. God, you have turned my mouth, my morning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth. You have clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Awareness is key. Knowing matters. I know who God is. I know who I am. And I know whose I am. I know to pray, and I know now, again, to live my life as God's beloved. The words and way of the psalmist are a prototype for our existence. Are we acting as though we are in the know? How is Psalm 30 coming to life in and through you? How is this a reality? Do we know who we are as the people of God? Are we ready to claim and proclaim it in word and in deed? The world has a desperate need for our voice, for the voice of the psalmist, for the voice of the Christian church disciples of Christ, for our prayer, 
for our understanding. It is time for us to share that voice. And like the psalmist, who better than us to tell it? And who do we tell it to first? Then our God. So to end our time together this morning, I think it is apropos for us to spend it in a time of prayer. And a prayer around this five-structured prayer we just learned from our psalmist. So if I might ask you, would you close your eyes and join me in a time of prayer? God, we know who you are. We ask that you hear our silent prayers as we tell you what we know about you. God, we know who you are. We know who we are. And we ask that you hear our silent prayers as we tell you what we know about ourselves. God, we know that we could not be here who we are by ourselves. We know we are dependent upon you. We ask that you hear now our silent prayers as we celebrate our relationship with you. We know to pray, and in this moment, we sit in silence, and we take an opportunity to simply listen for your still, small voice, to feel your gentle and constant presence, to not speak or demand, but to wait upon your response. We know you, O oh God. We know ourselves. We know the relationship we need with you. We will continue to listen for your voice and your leading. And as a result, we know and trust in our hearts that you are calling us into a life that lives out our faith. So in the silence of prayer, we ask that you reveal to us the ways in which we are needed, the ways in which we are capable of sharing your love with others. God, it is not too late for us. We have seen mourning turn into dancing, and you clothe us in joy. May our praise not be silenced. God, we, your people, proclaim with our lives 
thanksgiving to you now and forevermore. You are good and we your people respond. Amen. I mentioned already this morning our open table, how all are welcome to this table. And when we say all are welcome, I was reminded by words a, a colleague wrote this week in the wake of what has been happening. Brandon Gilvin said, we can proclaim an open table without claiming false equivalencies. We can welcome those whose hearts are full of hate, but we must remind them to turn their hate over and leave it at the table. We must resist the injustice we see, and we must resist the things inside of us that keep us from seeing that justice is what, looks, is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. And at an open table, we describe a body that is both broken and whole, and we share its weight when we share in this feast. We share in this act together, for we are a people united in Christ. We may not always be united in ideal or in understanding, in hope or in purpose, but we are united in Christ. If that is the one thing to bind us together and see us through, I think that's saying something, and I think there is hope. And so we come to this, our Lord's table, and we remember as Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and offered it, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. We celebrate as he took a cup and he poured it. He said, take a drink in this cup. Is my brokenness poured out for you? We come to this table in remembrance of him, in hopes that the broken will be made whole, in hopes that all might see and come to a place of love and understanding. This is the table of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me as we sing together our hymn of communion? <laughs>